In this episode, I'll riff off of a student's question to our Facebook group where she was wrestling with feeling emotionally and physically dysregulated and what she should do with her horse during those times. So here we go. Episode 163, Should Not. I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. So I have been thinking and sort of mulling over a, a, a topic for this episode, and I had started taking some notes, but like things weren't really solidifying. But then I looked in the Facebook group for our Dressage Naturally Land Facebook group, and somebody posted this scenario and this question. And I was like, oh, this is kind of what I was trying to get straight in my mind and try to figure out how to talk about it. So this post was posted anonymously. So of course, I'm going to share it without a name. Um, But I think it's just so helpful. And um, the post was getting a lot of attention and a lot of really cool um, feedback and commenting. So I got the message that this was something that was ready to be talked about. Now, I know the title of this episode is a little weird, should not. It kind of sounds like I'm going to tell you stuff that you should not do, but it's actually kind of more of a Shakespearean or maybe a Yoda (laughs) way of saying, don't should. (laughs) All right, clever, right? Okay, so (laughs) let's just get right to the post. So um, this person wrote, Do you ever go through phases where you're emotionally and physically dysregulated and don't feel right about riding your horse? I keep thinking to myself, I have no business trying to balance my horse when I can't even balance myself. I do take him on daily walks over varied terrain, and actually this is the thing that helps me feel better. We trot a bit too, but sometimes my mental gremlins get in the way and tell me that I should be doing more, or I get worried that he's going to lose fitness. Relatable? And so this post got so many lovely supportive responses, and I just, I love my tribe. <laughs> and I really appreciated the vulnerability and, you know, kind of asking the question that, for me personally, like I can completely relate to this. And I know that there's so many other people that can. I mean, we're we're just simply human. We're going to have our ups and our downs and our easy days and our hard days and the days where just, yeah, sometimes I feel like I got no business riding. And you know what? That's okay. (laughs) And that is amazing self-awareness right there. And I like to point these things out, even if it seems obvious, because there's plenty of people going around bombing through life, not aware, and showing up to life and their horses, um, unaware that they are emotionally and physically dysregulated, and then they go and take it out on their horse or anybody else (laughs) that's around them. So I always like to highlight this kind of beautiful self-awareness. Now, I'm going to share some of the really cool things uh, that people offered as advice in the comments um, at the end of this episode. Uh, But I'm going to muse a little bit first. (laughs) And, you know, one of the things that struck me about this um, is how, how much we humans are masters at feeling guilty for doing too much and feeling guilty for not doing enough. (laughs) And it's not just that different people feel guilty for these different things, but in the same individual, okay, I'll speak for myself, at the same individual, in the same moment, in the same circumstance, I can feel, well, if I do too much, I'm going to feel bad. If I do too little, I'm going to feel bad. (laughs) Thank you, brain. And I love seeing people picking up on the brain gremlins. (laughs) Because I think it's the, that terminology, because that's one of the most important things is to go, hey, brain, like, what the heck? <laughs> what are you telling me? All right. So like I said before, I think 
in general, I think it is a, it's brilliant to notice when you're not in your best, um, positive mental, emotional, or physical state. And I think it's brilliant to decide to alter your actions based on that. Right. So whether, you know, you're like, and it can be in a positive way too. It'd be like, you know, I wasn't going to ride today, but I'm really feeling good. And kind of my horse is kind of giving me this vibe that maybe it would be a good day and then go for it. And the same way, if you're like, you know, I'm not feeling so patient today, or, you know, I got the, what I call the dropsies. Anybody else have that? The dropsies where you just like, it seems all day just dropping stuff. <laughs> like on days when you have the dropsies or you're a little tired, or a little frustrated, change what the plan is. I think that's brilliant. So there's also though, um, the piece in that question about, you know, I'm not physically good enough or what business do I have riding my horse? So there can be, there's kind of, I'm, I'm hearing that and I'm sort of picturing these different scenarios where I have heard stuff like that come up with students And there's sort of the, oh, I'm having an off day. Today's not a good day to do fancy stuff. Like that's, like I said, that's brilliant. I think that's wisdom at times. But then I've also heard people say that sort of thing in a very general way. It's like you wake up one day and you go, oh my God, like what am I even doing riding? You know, or you watch a video of some really, really beautiful rider and you just go, oh, I got no business on a horse. Right. So that's um, something that I would say, like, well, let's let's look at that and make sure that you're not just turning this one bad moment and giving it meaning bigger than what it really has and going, I'm just generally terrible and I just generally shouldn't be allowed on a horse again. So when I first saw this post, um, I was kind of on my way to something. So I I really wanted to give a comment. So my quick comment um, in general, because there are already some people who had posted on there, is just, um, was this. I wrote, be gentle with yourselves. I can relate to. Just remember, there is no external source of what you should be doing. You are enough and just be. So that was my, my quick answer. And then I, you know, I just kept thinking about this post and just how beautiful it was and the beautiful responses. And I thought, okay, well now, now maybe I can expand beyond um, four sentences. (laughs) So, all right, where do we start? Um, I think I'll start with the, just the, the, you know, what business do I have riding if I'm you know, trying to balance my horse if I'm not balanced, you know, and let's say, okay, we all have the bad days. Let's put that, of course, if you're having a bad day, just do something different that day. That's okay. But the bigger picture. So if that becomes a chronic way of thinking, then we have to watch out for that. And I, and, you know, riding is something that you and your horse learn together, right? So horses aren't natural born, you know, things to be written. We teach it to them and they have to learn how to be ridden and we have to learn how to ride. And even if the horse has been ridden and we've ridden other horses, we have to learn how to do that together. And that's, it's a relationship thing. And it's, there's no one like you and your horse. So this moment in time, you just have to do your best. And outside of, you know, sort of standards of care and keeping horses safe in the society, there are, there are fewer rules and shoulds than people assume. There's no absolute third party who gets to say, if you're good enough, who gets to say what's right, right? Especially for you specifically, So we can, you know, have different ways of measuring, but there's no absolute third party who gets to say what is right, especially for specifically you. And, you know, I think more than ever, there is so much pressure out there these days. And this was another, I've got another episode kind of brewing in my brain, just, 
you know, ab- about the, the, the burden of being someone who cares <laughs> a lot about our horse's experience. It feels heavy sometimes when I'm out there, um, you know, on social media and just around. It's like sometimes the conversations, the heartfelt conversations about being the best for our horses feel actually quite heavy (laughs) and hard and complicated. So I'm always trying to like, yes, it's deep stuff. And you guys know I can get deep, but there, it turns into a lot of pressure. And then people who care is harder and we end up getting harder on ourselves. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking like back in the day, I'm in this really cool age, this really cool generation where like we didn't have internet <laughs> for a lot of my life and a lot of my time developing as a rider. There was no such thing as internet. So it was easier in a way. Like you you follow and learn from the local choices. And the only people you see is that person and the other local riders. You know, or you maybe make a bigger decision to like travel somewhere and go study with somebody further away. But then that's a really big commitment. And it's often very single focused, right? You travel over there and study with that person. And it was easy because you just do what they do and do what they say. But now there's so much information out there, so many more examples to try to emulate. And I think this is like in the background of so many people's brains, because there's pressure to do more, and there's pressure to do less. (laughs) Right? So, and, and we have goals, we should achieve and work hard and be correct. You got to be correct. (laughs) No, you got to be perfect. (laughs) Anyway, I'm just kidding. That's what's out there. And then, so you have all that, like goals, achieve, progress, be correct, get the protractor out. It has to be perfect. And then at the same time, there are those out there who are screaming welfare and saying that riding is hurtful in general. And I mean, screaming welfare, of course, we want to take care of the welfare of the horse. However, there's a whole spectrum and there are some very hurtful (laughs) people who do things that are hurtful in the name of welfare. So there's everything in between also. So the rider who cares, who wants to progress and wants to do the best for their horse is, you know, we've got so much of this background stuff. Some of it is amazing. Some of it is not so amazing. Some of it is loving. Some of it is hurtful. From all sides of the spectrum, everything in between, there are so many voices. And it can get confusing. I think it's much more confusing to me, in a way, making decisions for my horses because you know, I can go the whole way. It's like, do, am, is this just going to be a Liberty horse? Am I just going to be the relationship? Cause that's just as important as dressage, but I kind of like to get them a little more balanced over here, but the relationship, it was easier before I just did the stuff, <laughs> right? I just did the stuff. I did the stuff. I, I wrote in the class, I got the score and then I did the stuff again. So there's one maybe good possibility that could come from there being so many voices. Because maybe having so many voices is going to actually make it clearer that you need to cut through the, the din and that the most important voice who matters is yours. And the people you choose to trust to help you solve problems that you want to solve or improve things that you want to improve. You know, so when it was just me and my trainer, that was easy in a way because like, oh, I just do what my trainer says. (laughs) 
But sometimes a person like that in an authoritative situation like that can lead people straight down a path to somewhere they don't really want to go. And and then you just convince yourself, well, I should be doing that. Right. So with so many voices out there, it can be you know, like, if you can you imagine getting to the poise, point where you're just like so frustrated, like everybody just shut up, <laughs> like close the laptop, turn off the phone, stop Facebook, stop the noise and just go, what do I want to do? Oh, it's a good question, huh? You know, sometimes you'll feel conflicted because the people around you and your horse have different goals and they assume that you have the same goal too. And sometimes we don't realize that we're among people with completely different goals and people who are using completely different measuring sticks. So you'll do things that make you happy and others are going to tell you it's wrong or you should be doing something else. But they don't know that you're aiming for something different and have different signs of success and different principles and priorities. So be aware of who is around you and most of all, Be aware of who you are and what your vision is, what your goals, principles, and priorities are, and know how you want to measure your own success. And these same conflicts happen to me too. You know, when you care a lot, it really can be an emotional roller coaster, wrestling with all those shoulds. You know, how could I be better? What should I be doing? And like I said, looking back, thing, things seemed easier. And when I was learning, I had no expectations. I just did stuff, <laughs> right? I just did stuff. I learned. I did more. It was all positive because I didn't have any pressure on myself. You know, so now there's pressure. There's history. There's everything I have been working towards my whole life. And then having to keep up with that, stay relevant as a professional, prove myself, And sometimes I realize these days that I'm using a much harsher measuring stick than necessary. And then there's the whole like, you know, aging thing and the realization that I'm starting to feel sort of diminishing returns on the same efforts. You know, I can't sit like I used to. I'm not as bold as I used to be. And, you know, sometimes I just feel like, you know, I, I can picture my former self and then I picture the, pre- you know, I have the pressure of what I think I should be doing and I feel like I'm just terrible. But you know what? That's not true. I mean, it can feel like it. I think it means that I care. And from what I've noticed is the students that wrestle the most with this are often the ones that care the most deeply. I think getting to that place where you feel that emotion, if it's in there, you want to feel it. And the ones who care the most often are the hardest on themselves. But you know, when I feel like that, I also know it means I'm thinking a lie. That's why it feels so bad. And so if I trace it, if I make myself say the things that are bothering me out loud, I get to hear the brain gremlin. And then I can face it and I can ask things like, according to who? So when I say things, I hear my brain gremlin saying, I'm just not a good rider anymore. I can say, according to who? (laughs) Or if I hear my brain saying, oh, you should really be doing more. I can say, says who? (laughs) And at first it seems a little bit, you know, just like, you know, not a real question, but it's really a question. I mean, really ask, like, who's saying that? According to who's going to say that I'm good? What does that look like? And then inevitably, when I go on this little search, I figure out that there's a third party in my head, not that the third party is in my head, but in my head that there's a third party. There's somebody out there and it can get very specific which is super helpful. I'm like, really? I'm still doing it based on this other person's opinion and they're not even here watching me? Oh, so that needs to stop. So 
in that, you know, sometimes I think maybe her question originally was about, I'm just feeling really emotionally dysregulated. Maybe I shouldn't ride, you know, yes. And then sometimes that starts to compound and we feel bad about feeling bad. And then we feel bad about feeling bad that we're feeling bad and it snowballs. So this is the sort of thing we want to stop and start to look at it, go, wow, that's an interesting emotional reaction. Like who's telling me these things? (laughs) Who, according to who make it get real. So the thing is I get to decide. And so do you what I want to do well, you don't get to decide what I want to do. (laughs) I get to decide what I want to do, how much I want to do it, and what's fun and what my relationship with my horses are like. You get to decide what you want to do and how much you want to do it and what's fun for you and what your relationships are like with your horses. I get to decide who to listen to and who to get advice from and who to help me. You get to decide who to listen to who to get advice from, and who to help you. Now, another source of emotional moments like that are when I'm holding on to old dreams or old goals or old expectations. So with the person who, you know, posted it, you know, oh, I might be losing, my horse might lose fitness or I should be doing more. Like I'm wondering if there's like an old goal or an old expectation, or some person, like, who said that? Who told you that it's not okay if your horse doesn't do aerobic (laughs) physical exercise, you know, a certain number of days a week? So it's somebody in there said that. And we, you know, it's, I find it helpful to figure that out. But often it's, it's our own, it's our own goals and visions and dreams that maybe need to be updated from time to time, right? So I have a, you know, for a long time, I had competitive goals and I was competing, you know, locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. And, you know, you train a certain way when you have those goals. And sometimes there's residual stuff of that. I'll find myself pressuring myself and my horses. And I'm like, why? (laughs) Why do they have to do that right now. And if I stop and ask myself, I realize actually they don't. (laughs) I don't have a competition in two weeks. If it's not working, I can stop and try something else. If we feel like we're getting a little sour to the arena, I don't have to go in the arena. If I feel like they need a break from riding, I can hang out in the barn with them. Those of you who have the Happy Athlete Progress Journal where you like make your training plans will notice that built into that, some of the options are spa days (laughs) or partnership days. So I build into the training journal, remember to have days where you're doing, you know, giving them baths. (laughs) It all counts. It all counts. So those goals and visions And expectations need to be updated from time to time. Who gets to choose them? You do. For you. And I get to choose them for me. And it's not a failure to change course or change goals. Be really aware of what's called the sunk cost fallacy. And this is where someone is reluctant to abandon a strategy or a course of action because they've already invested really heavily in it. Even when it's clear that abandoning it would actually be more beneficial. I went through this big time and I wish I knew there was such thing as a sunk cost fallacy. Because when I left New York and when I you know, decided to not, I was in judge, you know, judge training for the, to be a dressage judge. I had done so much of it and I was just ready to the end. And I was like, but I really didn't want to do it. I mean, I was good at it. I think I would have continued to be good at it, but like, I didn't really, it's not how I wanted to spend my time. And I was training at this facility that I really didn't want to be at anymore. But I was like, well, I've come this far. 
I've come this far, got to keep going. And it was so hard to switch. It was unnecessarily hard because I didn't realize that I was, I had energetically committed to, I started on this path and if I need to get to the extreme opposite end of the path, you know, what is that? Like being an Olympic judge, trainer, and competitor, even though it's not really how I wanted to spend my time. But it felt to me to like changing that path or acting in ways that didn't directly go to that path. It felt like a failure. It was that sunk cost fallacy. And in reality, it's a fallacy. (laughs) It's built into the name. You're allowed to change. You're allowed to change your goals, change your expectations, and make them continue to serve you, to be beneficial to you. So dressage naturally, everything that I'm doing right now almost didn't exist because it was hard to walk away from the old strategies, the old courses of action. And yeah, there were lots of times when I'd be, you know, hanging around with my horses with non-demanding time or playing at liberty or doing silly horse tricks where there were voices in my head going, really? (laughs) Shouldn't you be doing something else right now? But luckily, I was having too much fun (laughs) to listen to them. All right. So I want to wrap this up with some random, just for other random thoughts on this. And then I'll share some of the beautiful pieces of advice from the post. So one thing is horses don't have their own goals or they don't wish they were competing. They don't look at themselves and go, you know, I'm a really good mover. (laughs) If only I had a pre-St. George rider and I could get those ribbon things that go around my neck. Like they don't think like that. So there's definitely horses who love to go do athletic things and they love to go new places and they love learning. And, you know, if you have one of those, it's nice to enrich their lives with doing things, no matter what kind of horse, do things that they enjoy. But a lot of times, Um, riders will look at themselves, look at their horse and go, oh, if only he had a different rider. I'm like, well, I don't think the horses are thinking that way. The horses are thinking, when do I get to graze again (laughs) or go play with my buddies? Right. So I think we can save ourselves a lot of grief by not um, thinking that our horses are thinking that way. And every great rider starts out as a not so great rider. So no one is perfect. And your horse isn't looking for perfect. Your horse is looking for harmony and his needs to be met and for things to make sense. So when we're not, you know, are balanced perfectly or things like that, you know, be gentle with yourself. Like it's, it, we're all starting somewhere. Every great rider started out as a, a not great rider. And if not being perfect, if lack of, if lack of excellence and mastery becomes an intolerable condition, you know, if it's, if it becomes as intolerable a condition as our brain gremlins often tell us it is, the whole world would grind to a stop and no one would improve on anything from that moment forward. So the truth is the only way to excellence is to be able to accept being bad at stuff. (laughs) We have to learn how to play badly well, because that's kind of just the reality. Just do our best, notice, and adjust. Okay. And I'll just reiterate again, you get to choose your goals. Remember to revisit your goals and make sure you still want them. You get to pick the vision and the reality of how you spend your time with your horses and the kind of relationships you want to have with them. Now, if they're going to be handled by other people, make sure you educate your horses in a way that they and others around them can stay safe. If you're having an emotional moment, step away But don't try to bury it or turn it off or pretend it's not happening. Let yourself feel it fully and let it flow. That's how it's going to 
go through its cycle and, and have less of a chance of becoming a chronic thinking pattern. Remember to ask yourself those questions that are going to help you understand the source of the emotions. There's really valuable information in there. And remember, there's often a lie in there that you're telling yourself. Find it, push on it, find the source of it. Ask yourself, who said that to me? Who's telling me that? And of course, ask yourself if it's true. All right, so I'll leave you here with now some of the responses in that post, and then I'll leave you with a little story. So one of the responses was, your horse doesn't care if you're riding or not. They do care that what you're doing brings you back to yourself. Someone else said, do what you need to do to feel like yourself and show up as the best version of you that you can. That's all your horse cares about. Someone else said, I know it's better to do less than not to be my 100% when riding and create an unpleasant experience for both of us. And I don't feel ashamed for it anymore. Someone else said, I've learned and I'm still learning that I'm treading my own path, not someone else's. When the time is right, I'll know, and my horses and me will work it out together. Remain true to you. You got this. And the last one I'll share is someone said, I comfort myself by thinking it's the price for the wonderful moments, some of which are just around the corner. Did I mention I love my tribe? (laughs) I love the people in the Dressage Naturally groups. So this one was from the Dressage Naturally Land Facebook group, which is not associated with any course. Anybody can join it. So please look on Facebook if any of this resonates with you. And now I'd like to wrap this up by reading a short passage that's in the book, The Four Agreements by um, Don Miguel Ruiz. And one of the agreements is, is, I love this book, highly recommend it, simple read, very powerful, hard to do. <laughs> anyway, the, four, the fourth agreement is always do your best. And so this is just a little excerpt from the chapter on doing your best. And he um, tells a story. Okay, this is from the book. There was a man who wanted to transcend his suffering, so he went to a Buddhist temple to find a master to help him. He went to the master and asked, Master, if I meditate four hours a day, how long will it take me to transcend? The master looked at him and said, If you meditate four hours a day, perhaps you will transcend in ten years. Thinking he could do better, the man then said, Oh, master, what if I meditated eight hours a day? How long will it take me to transcend? The master looked at him and said, If you meditate eight hours a day, perhaps you will transcend in 20 years. But why will it take me longer if I meditate more? The man said. And the master replied, You are not here to sacrifice your joy or your life. You are here to live, to be happy, and to love. If you can do your best in two hours of meditation, but you spend eight hours instead, you will only grow tired, miss the point, and you won't enjoy your life. Do your best, and perhaps you will learn that no matter how long you meditate, you can live, love, and be happy. So, do your best. Be gentle with yourselves. It all counts. Less is often more. Nothing is often something. You got this. 